So at the outset, I think awake spine surgery is something that is not something new. It has been there in existence and has stood the test of time already. Yes, it's just a reinvention of an old technique, probably with added precision to it. So what is awake spine surgery? It's not that there is no anesthesia to it. It is just a spine surgery without general anesthesia in a fully conscious patient. Where patient is awake, he's talking to you, cooperating in the surgery, he's awake. And it also can be supplemented by regional anesthesia, various forms, either in the form of spinal anesthesia or erector spinae block or transverse process block. And it has been a varied technique nowadays with the help of ultrasound techniques also you can enhance the benefit of uh, spinal anesthesia in these patients. And what you can do is any surgery from L2 to sacrum or even pelvic fixation can be performed using awake spine surgery. Question, is it new? You can see the number of searches, number of results that are available but just with awake spine surgery is more than 25 lakh results already available. Not only articles but also number of surgeons performing this is already growing up. It's not only about Google search but also PubMed shows you the number of articles which are present is more than 400 already in, in current times. So why do we do awake spine surgery? What is the advantage? I mean, general anesthesia has already stood the test of time. Everybody is so comfortable using uh, general anesthesia in spine surgery. Then why at all there is a need of regional anesthesia or a awake spine fusion in such patients? Because there is already an assumption that patient is not uh, uh, comfortable in a prone position while doing spine surgery. The advantages are plenty, which you really cannot neglect. Post general anesthesia delirium is just not seen. All these patients are awake all the times and the moment you turn them, they are happy, smiling all the times and they absolutely have no pain, no delirium, no hallucination. Nausea vomiting is absolutely not seen, not in a single patient. We have had this complaint of patients uh, saying that they are feeling nauseated or vomiting, not only in the immediate post-op, but also in the prolonged, in day one, day two procedure also. The pre-operative analgesic requirements are minimal, intra-operative problems are very, very less. The OR time comes significantly low. It has been proven and published in multiple occasions that the operative room time, overall the number, the number of hours that patient is inside the OT has gone down significantly. And so the post-operative and intra-operative monitoring required by an anesthetist is very, very less. The hemodynamic stability is also better and it is also published in papers that the requirement of vasoactive agents uh, to attain hemodynamic stability intraoperatively is far less, requiring lesser number of drugs to handle the hemodynamic stability of these patients. And believe me, in last three years what I have noticed is that the satisfaction rate of these patients is so high that it can actually be used as a marketing tool for, for spine surgery. More number of patients accept spine surgery compared to when you say about general anesthesia versus spinal anesthesia. And there is already evidence that if you offer spinal anesthesia or regional awake spine surgery in these patients, the acceptance rate is far better. Of course, the advantage of early mobilization also is in picture now. So is it safe? Yes, it is safe, it is time tested now. There is enough evidence to say that orthopedic, abdominal and pelvic procedures which are already commonly performed under regional anesthesia can now be benefits extended to spine surgery already and there is growing evidence already available. In our own experience, more than 1000 surgeries we have done in last 4 years in patients with L2 to L5 fixation or decompression procedures where patient selection has really made our life very easy and also satisfying for the patients. So the question is, if it is so good, there are advantages, why is it not widespread? It has also been studied that despite the clinical and financial benefits of avoiding general anesthesia, awake spine surgery has not been adopted among healthcare systems, not only because of the surgeons uh, tying away from the adv added advantages of spinal anesthesia or regional anesthesia, but also anesthetists not taking it up because of the fear that my colleagues will say that I am not prepared with the instrumentation or equipments to give general anesthesia. And this shying away can really be taken away once you are convinced that these advantages are of benefit not only to the patient but also to the healthcare system in reducing the OR times and also reducing the financial costs of drugs and general anesthesia monitoring systems that are required for general anesthesia, which all can be bypassed easily when you are resorting to awake spine surgery. When can you do awake spine surgery? Any surgery which is in lumbar spine can easily be performed up to two levels. Decompressions or fusions because of instability can easily be managed and, and take my word, all these patients absolutely have no apprehension, no problems intraoperatively. They are extremely comfortable lying prone for two to three hours time, which is the time duration of a spinal anesthesia or various forms of regional anesthesia that are used. In of course, it is not a blanket therapy that you can extend to all the patient. There are stringent indications and patient selection is a key to selection of patients for awake spine surgery. Uh, also, surgeon's experience and expertise also makes a big difference because if the same surgery a surgeon performs and takes a little longer time than usual should not be resorted to because of the limited duration of anesthesia and analgesia provided by spinal anesthesia. 
Now, we must also remember that there is a lag in, in the sensory benefits of spinal anesthesia or regional anesthesia because even when the motor effects do come by, even at the end of three hours surgery, the analgesia effect of spinal anesthesia lasts for eight to 12 hours and that can come to your advantage. So, a surgeon's expertise and choosing the patient is very well defined. And remember, it should not be used in patients wherever you expect that there is an airway compromise of the patient's belly is so big which can really make the patient uncomfortable. So, a BMI of more than 30 or a patient with restricted airway disease is something that you must not resort to awake spine surgery. There are protocols to follow. You just cannot use it as a blanket therapy. If you really want to start up with, I would recommend using it in a simpler case of alpha S1, use a spinal anesthesia, supplemented with a transverse process block, and you can actually not only do decompression, but also fusion. Even interbody fusion can be safely performed without adding any problems to the patient lying prone for those three hours. And we have been doing it for almost four years now. The most important aspect of awake spine surgery is not only the technique by the anesthetist or the conviction by the surgeon, but also counseling and consent that sometimes spinal anesthesia may go away and you may have to actually change a spinal into a general anesthesia or a sedation may have to be added. Remember, OR noise is something that adds to apprehension of patient and that's very important that whenever you're resorting to awake spine surgery, patient has to be counseled about the OR room noise by the staff. You have to reduce the mobility of the staff inside the OT and counsel the patient. Sometimes we also use noise cancellation earphones to these patients and music therapy sometimes really, really helps. Postoperatively, these patients are extremely comfortable for next 12 hours. You actually will require nothing in terms of pain management. You just have to counsel them that it is after the 12 hours of the anesthesia that you may start feeling pain where your pain management uh, techniques may really come into picture. So how the preoperative protocol, as I mentioned, is all about communication and of course a consent and documentation of what you're going to do has to be informed to the patient. Pressure points, particularly in females, has to be kept in very, very important point because these are the areas which are not anesthetized and patients may really be apprehensive, not only to cover up these patients, but also to inform them that these are the pressure points. If you feel uncomfortable, you may actually, they can tell you and then you can take extra caution about it. Hydration preoperative is absolutely important. As we all know, it's a hypotensive kind of anesthesia that comes after regional anesthesia. So hydrate them preoperatively and pain like injection of astaminophen is something that is routinely given to all these patients preoperatively at least eight hours onwards. The spinal anesthesia or regional anesthesia is a routine thing. There's nothing that you do uh, extra. However, isobaric bupivacaine with fentanyl and tramadol is something that is commonly used by our anesthetist and they, that gives you a lasted effect of more than four hours for these patients. And so you can actually extend a surgery which can last right from incision to uh, out time of up to four to four and a half hours. And so this is something that can really work for any patient from T10 to S1 surgery and the injection is given at L34 level. So the OR protocols are very well defined. These are something that we routinely follow using noise cancellation, reducing the, the traffic inside the OT, giving it at L3-4, using the ultra-thin needle to avoid any intraoperative dural uh, punctures that are seen intraoperatively. And of course, the patient is given either a screen to view or a music to listen. And, and generally what I do is I ask the patient, what kind of music do you like? And they are really engrossed in that without complaining of any other problems there. Sometimes sedation may come handy if the patient is very apprehensive in these Post-operatively, these patients are given four hours of head-low position. However, no NBM is required. They can start taking fluids and oral diet can be started immediately after the surgery. <clears throat> Zero analgesics for up to 12 hours. Actually, they really don't complain because of the lag effect of sensory recovery in these patients. And nursing staff is also informed that these patients can be mobilized as soon as the motor power recovers in these patients. Yes, sometimes urinary retention may happen, which can be relieved only by one K90 catheterization to relieve the bladder fullness. Again, remember, it's very safe in geriatric. Age is not a contraindication. The only contraindication is patients with high BMI or with restrictive lung disease. You can actually do it in even patients from L2 to pelvic fixations if you can finish the surgery in a well-timed manner. Some case examples where we have been doing this not only to get fusion in awake spinal fusion, where blood loss is also less, OR time is very less, they can be mobilized very early, and of course, post-operative delirium and pain immediately post-operatively, absolutely not seen in any of the patients. We have actually set up a daycare spine surgery unit with SDA, same day admission, and patients can really be walking the same evening, moving out of the hospital next day, particularly in decompression uh, or surgeries like these. So the advantages are plenty. You really cannot neglect them. You really cannot hold upon them. And it is a gold standard now. We have done more than 1,000 plus surgeries. And it is not only highly satisfying to the patient, but also the acceptance levels of spine surgery is really coming up. Yes, there are problems, but you have to get convinced first to start a daycare spine surgery unit with the advantages of ERAS, enhanced recovery, which our follow-up speaker is going to come up with. And you believe me that more than 1,000 more than plus surgeries have shown us the way to, uh, to, of the future to it. Yes, there are problems with this. Intraoperatively, dural puncture can be seen in up to 10% patient, but this can be circumvented by using ultra-thin needle in such patients. 
Vasovagal syncope can happen particularly in young patients with a uh, big tummy there. However, other hemodynamic problems which are thought of in general anesthesia like hypotension or postoperative headache or even cardiopulmonary issues are not seen in any of such patients. <laughs> Liposomal bupivacaine, so far not introduced in India, but the moment we get this molecule in India, we'll have these surgeries can, which can be extended all the way to six to eight hours because liposomal bupivacaine can really give you extended benefit of anesthesia in such patients for more than six hours already proven in literature. So to summarize, awake spine surgery under renal anesthesia is a reality with significant advantages over general anesthesia with better higher satisfaction rates and acceptability rates among the patients. The patient selection and OR protocols are very well defined and the algorithm is there to follow if you are fairly convinced about it. Thank you so much.